The peak of Denali poked through the fog like an ancient foreboding monolith, silhouetted by a sun that refused to set. We drove toward it in a park ranger SUV. We stopped at the gated boundary of Denali National Park, at the behest of National Guardsmen, garbed in full mop gear. Most everyone had seen it on the news. The story told of chronic wasting disease that finally made the leap to human transmission. The outbreak centered on Denali. They locked the whole place down. Even I had believed it. But our presence told a different tale. Why would they send the 13 Special Forces group to a quarantined park? Moreover, to the top of a mountain, I wondered. What waited for us on that peak? The gas-masked guards, satisfied with our orders and identity, waved us through the gate. The SUV drove deep into the park on roads that showed a year's worth of minimal maintenance. Overgrown brush scraped at the paint of the vehicle. We entered a narrow clearing. A helicopter sat there hidden amongst the dense forest. We got out and put on our winter attire. The six of us hopped into the silver and red chopper with the brand Temsco emblazoned below its rotary wings. The blades blurred into motion and we lifted off. The trees fell away as we gained altitude. They were replaced by rock and soon a blanket of white. Eventually we reached our destination on the western buttress. From our perch in the heavens, I discerned the unnatural shape of snow-covered concrete buildings and walls. It looked like a fortress or prison. We landed and disembarked. An entourage of armed soldiers escorted us through the structures into a room with several seats and a projector screen. Waiting for us was the bald, brown dome of a man with the insignia of an eagle on his collar. We sat down in anticipation for the solution to our mystery. My name is Colonel Smith, said the man as he turned on the projector. The screen displayed a detailed map of the facility. Now, I'm not big on words, so here it is. In the center of this complex is a portal. Before you ask, no, we can't blow it up. We tried. He clicked to the next slide. The image of a creature appeared on the screen. It looked like a translucent ball of tentacles. Orange fluid patterned the ice around its bullet-pulverized body. I tried to muffle the gasp that slid through my lips. Some of my squad members muttered curses under their breath. We call them Icosapi, continued the colonel. Four feet tall and capable of ripping you to shreds. Their bodies are coated with an acid. Don't let them touch you. The next screen showed us a diagram of the center of the complex. Weapon emplacements dotted the edges of the empty field, and guard posts filled the gaps between them. Here are your positions. The Pentagon sent us scientists. They are working to close the portal permanently. Your duty is to ensure they perform that function. Do not let the Icosapi break through. Colonel Smith turned off the projector. The Icosapi are predators. Nothing more than dangerous animals. I don't know why the DoD thought we were necessary here, but orders are orders. And get used to the cold. I expect soldiers, not popsicles. Your XO will have shift details. Dismissed. Finished Smith. I walked out of the room, mind reeling. The whole briefing felt surreal. I was just a rookie, fresh out of the Q course. I had been in combat before, but this was something beyond reason. Portals and aliens, I thought. Questioning my decision to go to Special Forces Selection? What the hell did I get myself into? Major Rowe's arm stopped me in the corridor. You all right, Sergeant Tucker? He asked. What? Yeah, just fine, sir. I replied. Hold tight for a minute, then. I haven't assigned your quarters yet. Oh, right. I said, embarrassed. Don't sweat it, Tuck. We all felt the same way after our briefing, he said. The Major specified rooms and duty shifts to the squad. The minimal space in the base required two per quarters. 
Rose split us up by rank. He roomed me with Staff Sergeant Casimir Golowich and regulated us to night shift. We went to our rooms being granted a day to acclimate to our new post. In our quarters, Casimir produced a deck of cards. Texas Hold'em? he asked. I agreed and we engaged in a heated game of poker. While we played, we exchanged stories. I told him of the specialist I knew who chewed on plastic buttons, thought that Abraham Lincoln was a black man, and could deadlift 600 pounds. He recounted the tale of a joint training with the Aussies, and how his first lieutenant had almost called in a live mortar strike on top of an entire Australian brigade. I recalled my childhood trauma of being raised by a meth addict mother that tried to keep me from my father. He told me about his wife and twin girls that were waiting for him at home. This conversation continued until Casimir possessed every penny in my wallet and our first duty shift drew near. He was one rank my superior and five years my elder, but I grew to know him as a friend. I called him Gallo because I couldn't pronounce his last name. We spent our uneventful shifts watching the empty field. The supposed night felt more like subdued day. The sun never fell, but hovered, sank for a moment, and rose again like an unruly child refusing bedtime. And then it happened. I expected lightning, sound, flashes of light, something, anything, but they came silently and swiftly. Icosapi flooded outward from the center of the field. Explosions of emplaced mines alerted us to their presence. As if led by a conductor, the machine guns, rifles, and explosive ordnance burst all at once. Gunpowder smoke wafted over a confetti of neon orange fluid and severed tentacles. I added to the orchestra of weapons fire with blind shots of my own. As the horde closed in, a circle of claymore mines activated. Nothing moved in the center of our defensive circle. Major Rowe signaled ceasefire. We stopped, and the smoke cleared. Piles of dead icosapi sat in the center of the field. They melted away like ice on a hot asphalt. My heart pounded in my chest. I smirked. <laughs> they aren't shit, I thought. Screaming erupted all around. I turned to the closest source. Major Rowe kicked and flailed as a group of Icosapi tangled his limbs. The clear ribbons of their tentacles sank through his uniform and carved gouges in his flesh. I swung my M4, but couldn't find a clear shot. My head swiveled erratically. I saw others caught in balls of wriggling appendages. Somehow, the monstrosities had found their way behind us. The Icosapi dragged the soldiers toward the center of the field. A few of the more confident marksmen took careful pot shots at the creatures, to no avail. Some of the things dropped dead from bullet wounds to their center, but the others moved on without regard for fallen comrades. Shrieks of pain racked my ears. Never before had I heard such a sound issue forth from human lips. A few soldiers ran toward the masses of writhing tentacles. I thought to join them. But Gallo, sensing my intent, held me back. The soldiers pried and ripped at the gelatin, but only managed to ensnare themselves in the blob of men, mucus, and monsters. The Icosapi tumbled gracelessly, with their prey in tow, and vanished. I believe not one of us came out of the experience with our sanity intact. Our command chain was in disarray. Most of those dragged away were officers. Was it just random chance, or were those things targeting our leadership? I asked myself. It seemed to be the latter. Colonel Smith had been wrong. The Icosapi were basic enough in their attacks, but simplicity belied tactics and intelligence. We faced something more than mindless animals. Gallo opted out of a card game when our shift ended. I couldn't blame him. I had only known Roe for a short time, but Gallo had spent many deployments under that man's leadership. 
I settled into bed and read. As the words on my page blurred and my eyelids drooped, Gallo spoke. I want to go home. I miss my children. Don't worry about it. The scientists will close the portal and we can put this whole shit show behind us, I said. I'm not sure it will be so simple. You felt it. Same as me. There's a superstition in the 13th SF. We have no name for it, but if you look into our history, you'll find occurrences from the very beginning. On certain deployments, only one man in a dozen makes it out alive. <laughs> That's bullshit. Think so? Captain Fullard, Vietnam. His team was ambushed by Viet Cong in deep jungle. Only Fullard lived to tell the tale. He had been shot 12 times, bayoneted and blown up. They found him buried, still alive in a pile of 30 corpses. First Lieutenant Rodriguez. They were training the Laotian military. Communist rebels within it took them by surprise. Rodriguez and one other escaped. The other died of his wounds and only Rodriguez made it. Two instances hardly prove Sergeant First Class Bush, Saudi Arabia. An Iraqi deserter wandered into his outpost. The deserter was bait. The outpost was shredded apart by insurgent fire. Saudi Special Forces found Bush slicing off the index fingers of the Iraqis that had taken the lives of his team. Staff Sergeant Johnson, Afghanistan. A mortar strike killed everyone except him. His leg was blown off. He packed mud in the wound to stop the bleeding and played dead when the insurgents checked for survivors. Master Sergeant Cohen, Iraq. Somehow, their bird was nailed by a lucky RPG. Cohen survived the crash and fought his way across the countryside to his destination 100 miles away. All right, you've made your point, but I still think this is different. Is it, though? Every deployment was strange, and this is about the strangest I've ever been on, or even heard of. Just, if you're the one that makes it, promise to take care of my daughters. Fine, I promise. Now will you let me get some sleep? Despite my insistence and fatigue, visions of translucent tentacles and gun flashes filled my dreams and spoiled my rest. I drifted off again before the alarm brought me fully awake. Gallo hopped up and sprinted out the door. I hobbled, dazed, after him. The hallway buzzed with activity. Men ran both directions through the chaos. What the hell is going on? I asked through a half-asleep haze. We have to arm ourselves! We're under attack! yelled Gallo. I followed him as we made our way through the throngs toward the armory. We entered and scavenged what little equipment we could from the near-empty shelves. I grabbed a SIG P320 pistol and an M249 saw. Gallo snagged a Colt 1911 and an outdated M16, as well as an AT-4 rocket launcher. We gathered as much ammo as we could carry and even pocketed a few grenades. The sound of metal crashing into concrete drew our attention. First Lieutenant Deschamps collapsed to the floor. A unit of shelving laid on its side across the door. He clutched at his guts. Deschamps! The fuck is going on out there? I asked. Goddamn miserable shits! So many! So many! Huge! Why are they so big? Nobody said they'd be big! What else could we do? What do they want us to do? Screamed Deschamps. Tuck, he's injured. Try to get it under control while I watch the door said Gallo. I looked at Deschamps and saw a gash stretched across his belly. The lacerated skin barely held his insides from pouring out. Blood and clear fluid leaked from the wound. I moved him away from the door and pressed a rag against his gash with both palms. I didn't understand where the pus was coming from, but I needed to stop the bleeding. Gallo pointed his rifle at the door. Deschamps continued hollering, Can't fight! Too many, too big! Why are they so big? So many. We killed and killed and killed and everyone's dead. They're all dead. I couldn't stop it. Dead, 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 or worse, gone. Gone and vanished. Where did they go? I stuck him with a syringe of morphine. 
bent the needle, and attached it to his uniform. His cries simmered to a murmur. The pressure of my hands caused his insides to collapse. I recoiled. The indentation in his gut pooled with fluid. It looked like viscous water. Deschamps choked, gagged, flailed, and then went still. Deschamps is dead, I said. What? He looked bad, but I didn't think it was fatal. At the very least, he should have survived for hours, said Gallo. He fucking melted, Gallo. His stomach nearly swallowed my damn hands. All right. We can't waste any more time here. Let's get to the lab and help evacuate the science team. Are you nuts? Did you hear me? He melted. Like a goddamn popsicle. We have to get out of here. Sergeant Tucker, get a hold of yourself. Think for a second. If these creatures escape the mountain, do you think the National Guard will stop them? What of Fairbanks, Canada? You have no family, you can't understand, but I have a wife and two daughters and I am sworn to defend as a soldier and a father. We stop them here. And those scientists are our only shot at putting an end to this. Tuck, I'm fighting whether you come with or not. Fine. You've made your point. I don't like it, but I'll follow your lead. I said. I slung a belt of 556 five, rounds into the M249, closed the cover, and racked the charging handle. Good. Now help me get this shelf off the door replied Gallo. We pushed the metal cabinet off the floor and righted it. I took a position at the side of the door. Gallo opened it and I pointed the barrel of the gun through into the hallway. Silence replaced chaos. The frenzied masses had vanished. Blood was smeared across the walls and floor. Gallo and I ran at a brisk pace through the hall towards the labs. We kept a constant vigil in all directions. But no one and nothing stood before or behind us. The facility felt completely deserted. We passed the barracks, rec room, and mess hall, and then as we ran past the medical center, we heard screams. Help! Oh god, help! Help me! Gallo motioned for me to enter. I stepped over the shattered remnants of the door. The sounds of a struggle echoed around the empty, blood-stained cots. The voice came again. You're gonna work for your meal. I won't go down easy. The voice originated from the office. Gallo kicked in the door. The beast stooped over the doctor. It stood, a towering eight feet, crouched aloft on five limbs. Organs showed bright neon in its elongated clear body. It looked like a giant ant, with a bulbous rear, a rounded thorax, and a thin point for its head. A symmetric antenna covered the length of its back. Numerous spindles thrashed about on its underside. Three of these tendrils wound around the man's calf. Purple flesh bulged from under his torn pant leg. He slashed at the monstrosity with only a scalpel. I pulled the trigger. Swaths of clear tissue and orange blood splattered across the wall. Gallo fired into the center of the thing and caught the organs. It fell, dead. The man kicked the tentacles free and slipped a tourniquet around his leg, as high above his knee as he could manage. I stepped over the creature and tightened the tourniquet. The doctor hissed from the pressure. I noticed that embroidered on his patch was the last name Fitzgerald. What the fuck was that thing, I asked. Not a clue. It got me good, he said. Shock already glazed his eyes. What happened here? Asked Gallo. So many wounded. I tried to treat them, but the infection is rapid. It doesn't respond to antibiotics or antivirals. I just figured out that cutting off the blood flow slowed its progress when the tentacle freaks came in droves. They carried off my patients. The skin on his leg burned bright red, then translucent. I saw blue veins and liquefying bone. I hid from the icosapi under my desk. They couldn't find me, but this creature, he pointed to the sizzling corpse of the beast, this bastard seemed to know exactly where I was. Oh, Christ, my leg. It's dissolving, isn't it? I looked down at his foot. Already it puddled into liquid. 
You're gonna make it, just... Just hold on, I said, as I tightened the tourniquet even more. I've got the blood completely cut off now. You're probably going to lose the leg, but I think you'll keep your life. No. It's not enough. Cut it off. Cut it off. Yelled Fitzgerald. He jammed the scalpel into his knee and sawed at the unyielding muscle and tendon. Before I could wrestle the blade away, his leg disintegrated beyond the tourniquet. Blood spurted from his femoral artery. It mixed with the fluid and became a slurry of pink. Fitzgerald bled out in a matter of seconds. Clanging drew our attention to the vents. The lights went dark before dim amber illumination flashed on. I blasted a few bullets through the slats of the vent cover. What are you doing? hissed Gallo. The fuckers are only four feet tall, remember? I figured a couple of bodies would slow them down. They melt, dipshit, and you gave away our position. Let's get out of here. Now. Oh, and the doctor's screaming definitely didn't do that already, I snapped back sarcastically. He shot me a dirty look. We exited the clinic and continued toward the lab. I hoped that we would find nothing else left alive in the facility. My hope proved a vain fantasy. Other giant ant creatures barred our progress. Their pointed snouts honed in on any trace of survivors. We blasted orange chunks out of them before they got a whiff of us. When we arrived at the lab, its door had already been broken away. We stepped over the chunks of reinforced steel. Blood-stained monitors and machinery lined the walls, dead along with the rest of the electrical system. The scientists were gone, evacuated or dragged away to unknown worlds. In the center of the room sat four frozen glass cylinders. Open grates covered the top of the containers. They seemed to rely on defunct internal refrigeration, but now utilized the frigid exterior temperature as a temporary failsafe. Recently thawed water sat at the sides and bottom of the glass. One of the tubes held an icosapie with its numerous tentacles extended. The second contained a nude man. One of his arms had melted away to a clear jelly. The third held another man, even further into decomposition. His skin had become translucent, and you could see all of his bones and organs beneath. The fourth was just a blob of gelatin. The skin was completely gone, bones had vanished, and his organs had reformed into patterns of purple, green, red, and blue. What the fuck is this? Are they becoming? No, it can't be, I thought. Gallo, I think we are the Icosapi, I said. What? We are their fuel. The wounds, the rapid necrosis, the fluid, it all makes sense now. They are turning us into more of them. That changes nothing, Tuck. No one is left. Let's get out of here into the landing pad. Are you even listening to me? We are being turned into creatures. I know, yelled Gallo. It doesn't change anything. Get a hold of yourself. Everyone is gone. Our mission is to protect the civilians. If they're still alive, they are already at it. Or moving toward the evac point. We need to make sure they get off this godforsaken mountain so they can continue their work on the portal. I don't give a damn about melted flesh and fucking monsters. We have a job to do and we're the only ones left to do it. Man up and let's fight these fuckers. The scientists are our only hope. We have to ensure they can close that godforsaken portal. Well, how do you even know that they're still alive? Damn it, Tuck. I don't. But I choose survival. If they're dead, then so are we. Shit, I replied. All right. I'm with you. At the very least, we can get the fuck out of here. Good. Stay alert and follow me. We stepped over the broken door and into the hall. The silence maddened me. I expected opposition around every curve, but nothing impeded our gradual progress. We ran past the clinic and beyond the dorms before we heard a sound. It was a noise unlike any other. It sounded like a herd of stampeding elephants and someone violently expelling snot from their sinuses. It echoed through the hall in front of us. 
the source of the sound appeared. Icosapi flooded through the corridor, packed together wall to wall and ceiling to floor. Reds and browns striated the masses of translucent, wriggling appendages. They moved as a single massive tunneling worm. The concrete cracked, conduit bent, and light fixtures, both dead and dimly glowing, shattered. Gallo instinctively pulled the trigger on his rifle. Neon orange joined the blood and feces. Whatever he hit went limp, but the rest carried their corpses without slowing. Run! I shouted as I backpedaled. I saw Gallo roll something at the encroaching flood. He turned and sprinted to me. An explosion rippled through the Icosapi. It blasted a hole through their formation and the worm fell into disarray. Gallo caught up and we ran as fast as our legs could carry us. I looked over my shoulder. A number of Icosapi broke rank and scuttled towards us. Through here! It's our only chance, said Gallo, as he angled toward the door that led outside. I followed. He was right. We may be heading further into enemy territory, but that steel door is the only thing that can slow this immediate threat. Otherwise, we would be running in circles until they surrounded us. The door seemed to open even slower than usual. Gallo held down the button to open it so I aimed at the hallway and laid down careful bursts with my saw into the scattered icosapi that gave chase. The big metal gate finally opened wide enough, and we slid through. The worm, now reassembled and regrouped, barreled at us with incredible speed. Casimir and I sprayed bullets at the horde. Gallo had to switch to his 1911 rather than reloading just to keep them at bay. They nearly reached us by the time the door closed, we heard thousands of tentacles scraping at steel. We walked into the empty field. The sunlight struggled to find a path through the dense ice fog. Stillness and silence blanketed the expanse. We took the moment to rest. The cold kept us on our feet, but at least we weren't running anymore. I took a long swig from my canteen. I wandered a bit and examined the nearby surroundings. Blood-stained, fresh drifts of snow. No bodies remained, not even as clear fluid. Only spent brass and tattered shreds of uniform littered the ground. Tucker! screamed Gallo. I looked back at him. His finger pointed into the fog. I spun and pointed the barrel of my light machine gun. A massive shadow hovered like a towering wraith. It stood the size of a three-story building. A dark brown spike plummeted toward me and buried itself in the ice just to my right. I dove over a snowbank. Shrapnel whistled overhead and embedded itself in the hard-packed snow. Remarkably, I found myself uninjured. I flipped over and pressed my stomach to the ground. My eyes found a behemoth creature as it stepped out of the fog. It stood on eight stout, wide set legs. Its body was shaped like a flattened tick. Flailing whips covered its underside, and brown quills covered its backside. Flamboyantly colored organs dotted its clear interior. My finger pulled the trigger before my mind could process the shock. The stream of bullets hit their mark, but the trails they left in the translucent jelly stopped short of causing any meaningful damage. More spikes cascaded in an arc to where I had been. I ducked down as they shattered in sequence. When I dared a glance over the bank, something else exploded, this time on the back of the behemoth. I heard the characteristic clinking of a Mark 19. Gallo had manned one of the mounted grenade launchers. The behemoth flinched from the damage. Icosapi and ant things emerged from under its belly and converged on Gallo. They seemed entirely uninterested by me now. I unloaded on them as they climbed to his location. The fog tinged orange with a floating spray as I vaporized the beings with constant fire from my M249. I ran out of ammo and had to put my marksmanship to the test with the P320. 
the behemoth let loose a full spread of brown projectiles over Gallo's position. He took no cover. Shards of dark brown cut through fabric, skin, muscle, and bone. Casimir kept shooting. The explosion bored a hole through the brunt of the behemoth. It collapsed with a billowing cloud of snow thrust airborne by the weight of the creature. The monsters retreated. I shot with reckless abandon at the fleeing creatures. Gallo keeled over backward from his seated posture. I sprinted over to him. Red blossoms spread from the spikes stuck through his arms, chest, and thighs. Gallo! I shouted. He roused from unconsciousness. Remarkably, one of his lungs still functioned enough that he could speak. Tuck. My family. Promised. You. You're the one. Survive. He said. His flesh rapidly turned to translucent gelatin. I will. I will survive. I'll make sure your wife and daughters are taken care of. Rest easy, friend. I said. More likely I'll die too, but no need to trouble him with that. Gallo coughed and breathed his last. I snagged his dog tags, salvaged the rest of the 30-round magazines from his ammo satchels, and shouldered his unused A24. His body disintegrated into fluid. I aimed at where his chest had been and fired three shots. I wouldn't let him turn into one of those things. The brown spikes settled softly into the muck of liquid, snow, and blood. I pulled one of his tags free from the broken chain and dropped it onto his uniform. Hopefully, nothing would disturb it. Not that there's anything left to bury. I wiped away the water accumulating at the bottom of my eyelids. No time to mourn, I thought as my mental map of the facility kicked into overdrive like a manic GPS. I routed and rerouted escape paths to the evacuation point. Every calculation pointed straight through the empty field. It was a long trek to the other side, but it was the shortest path. The sun finally baked away the remainder of fog. I saw that my way forward was clear. I walked a few steps. A loud metallic crunch stopped me. I spun. The door we had entered burst apart. A cossipi poured out and spread. I swung the rocket launcher over my shoulder, aimed for the top of the door, and thumbed the firing button forward. Many of the creatures vaporized from the impact. Concrete and metal showered down, blocking most of the icosapi behind another temporary barrier. A few escaped the blast and beelined for me. I dropped the expended tube and ran. Less than halfway across the field, I heard the skittering of tentacles over snow and ice quickly overcoming me. I twisted around to shoot at it with my pistol. I slid and tripped, but landed a few bullets through its core. The whole world seemed to invert. My head spun. I saw bright beams of light soar past me in darkness. My temperature went from cold to boiling in an instant. Sweat evaporated into a steam that clung to my body in a swirling layer. I exhaled, but couldn't get the air back into my lungs. A pressure constricted around my ribs. I awoke on my back to the sight of a star-filled sky. A hazy yellow sphere hung among the smears of cosmic tinsel. The ground under me was charred to ash and pocked with blackened craters. I pushed myself to a seated position. Sporadic, broken ruins of a bizarre, bronze metal filled the horizon. The structures jutted up at random as far as my eyes could see. Similar to the ground, holes had been punched through the buildings. Looks almost like weapons fire or artillery strikes. Wait, where the hell am I and why am I sitting on my ass instead of getting the fuck out of here? Screamed my mind's reason upon its sudden return. I jumped up and ran back and forth as I tried to re-enter the portal. I even tossed myself onto the ground in an attempt to replicate the conditions that sent me through on the other side. Gallo's dog tag slipped out of my pocket and buried itself in the dust. 
I desperately dug through the cinders until I found it again. My eyes focused on the dog tag, so I didn't realize what laid just beyond. I blew the debris off and shoved it back into my breast pocket. Then I saw the bodies. Something had stacked the corpses into two piles, layering them like firewood on a grisly bonfire. Fellow soldiers, civilian personnel, hikers, and wildlife laid melting away into clear fluid. Solid streams of the liquid flowed steadily away from the piles in parallel directions. My gut told me to run, to flee away from the fluid as far as my feet would carry me, but I couldn't. Another sensation rose in my chest. It flowed up and boiled over. My cheeks flushed, my ears reddened and burned hot. I ground my teeth against each other. The desire for flight shriveled away from the heat of unbridled, reckless, burning rage. I carefully loaded an M16 magazine into my M249, ensured that my pair of grenades were secured in my pockets, and drew my SIG. This is suicide, claimed part of my brain. And if it isn't, vengeance will taste so sweet, said another. Given the options, I choose to die fighting. Isn't that the motto of the 13th Special Forces? Death or glory? I didn't understand it until now, but I can't ignore it. I blazed a trail between the fluids. The path seemed strangely clear of foes. I stopped jogging just in time to see several ants waiting in ambush. I plugged the closest one. A moment passed before the others reacted. Their pointed snouts twitched in an attempt to locate me. I shot another. The rest of them bore down on me, but struggled to pinpoint my position. I dropped a freshly unpinned grenade at my feet and counted seconds. One. The creature shot tentacles toward me. I stepped back slowly. Two. They drew closer and came within a few feet of me. Three. The clustered beasts pawed at the live grenade in ignorance of their fate. I dove behind a sheet of bronzes material. I heard the ants move to intercept me, but it was too late. The grenade detonated and blew all of them to orange, stained bits. I pondered the behavior of the streams of clear fluid. Regardless of obstacle, the liquid flowed straight as an arrow. It went over hills over metal, down valleys, and up sheer cliffs. It was reasonable to expect resistance all along the path, but if I were to take a perpendicular path and zigzag to the source, I might be able to make it with minimal opposition. I gotta save a bullet for whatever is responsible. I cut to the left at approximately a 45 degree angle. One of the taller, more jagged spikes of metal in the distance provided me with a point of orientation. I moved a considerable distance through the debris, angled back until I closed in on the stream, and then repeated the process. A couple times, a wandering icosapi or ant found me, but I made short work of them. A creek of fluid grew wider every time I saw them. I must be close now. I jogged into a clearing and turned back toward the fluid. A beam of purple light shot over my shoulder. It collided with a cliff and burst into a shower of cerulean sparks. The concussive force nearly knocked me over. I pointed my machine gun at the origin of the beam and let off one round. It ricocheted off of a plate of metal. Something living stood before me, pointing the end of a triangular bronze chunk at my chest. Purple electricity fitted about the muzzle of what I assumed was the gun that had almost flattened me. The being could have been the centaur-esque star of some schizophrenic nightmare. Two of its arms held the beam weapon, and two were armed with long blades that widened and looped at the tips. At least ten spindly fingers adorned each of its hands. Six legs supported the creature's elongated backside, and numerous thin toes splayed out at its feet. The arms attached to a head or torso that rose from the bottom of its body. Bronze plates stuck to its smooth and white skin through unknown means. The thing looked like gilded porcelain. 
a slit cut across the lower portion of the largest plate on the torso, revealing a wrinkled, fleshy pink organ. It isn't translucent, I thought. What the fuck is this thing, and why hasn't it killed me yet? I lowered my gun. To my shock, the centaur thing mimicked my action and pointed the beam gun at the ground. I waved my hand at it just to see if it would respond likewise. The creature remained statuesque. Alright, so... It isn't just imitating my actions. Must be that it doesn't really want to kill me after all. Was that initial shot just a warning? A scuttling sound drew my attention. A cossipi poured over the cliff. I lifted the barrel of my gun and opened up. Another beam of purple blasted into a group of the tentacle freaks. They burst open like overripe tomatoes. I shot at the rest until my firearm ran dry. I blew through two of the limited 30 round mags in an instant and reloaded yet another as my unlikely friend ran into the fray. The swords cut the Icosopi into ribbons. The centaur moved like an agile, frantic dancer, swaying and pirouetting through the multitudes without being touched once. Orange blood cascaded through the air in fans off the rounded tips of the blades. I picked off the last of the Icosopi until only dissolving bodies remained. I sighed in relief at both the outcome of our battle and the gain of a new ally. Then, something clattered behind me. I spun around. An ant stood just a few feet away. I pulled the trigger of the M249, and the firing pin clicked. I rammed the cocking handle back, but nothing ejected. I had no time for remedial action. It pounced. Pistol! I screamed at myself internally. But I knew that it was too late. Mindless reaction overrode rational thought. I dropped the machine gun to my side and punched at the thing with a left hook. My fist drove its way into the creature's tapered head. Almost immediately, tendrils latched onto my forearm. My skin blistered as the acid burned into my flesh. I screamed in pain. My knuckles liquefied. The fingers of my right hand found the grip of my P320, and I ripped it from its holster. Four shots put the beast down. The invasive tendrils receded. I dropped the sig and clasped at my inflamed forearm, my hand disintegrating to clear pus. With unconscious clarity, I grabbed a tourniquet out of my pant pocket and slid it over the remnant of my wrist. I tightened it down above my elbow. The dissolution of my arm slowed significantly. I've brought myself some time, but will it be enough? I doubted it. The memory of the doctor's demise was still fresh in my mind. God damn it. I'm not fucking ready. I need more time. At least let me have my revenge. I looked down at one of the grenades hung on my belt. Or I could just end it all now. No pain, no guilt, just oblivion. My fingers gingerly grazed the smooth surface of the explosive. I felt a slight pressure at my left elbow, and a skewing sound echoed over the barren landscape. I looked first at the figure of the centaur. He stood inches away from me. My eyes scanned down. He grasped the beam rifle with his top two hands and again pointed it at me. I looked at the first sword. An orange coating covered its normal bronze color. My eyes darted to the other. Something dark red glinted on the blade. I turned my gaze down and saw that there on the ground was a half-dissolved human arm. I blinked at it as realization detonated like an atomic bomb in my mind. A fringe of hazy black flittered on the edge of my vision. I looked at my left arm. Nothing remained but a stub. Darkness invaded my vision. Pain stirred me from my faint. I was slumped in the corner of a cramped room. Little yellow lights blinked upon oddly shaped consoles and machines. The centaur sat on its haunches nearby, seemingly waiting for me to wake up. I tried to push myself up, but forgot that I was missing a substantial part of my left arm. 
Without its support, I tilted over and bashed my stub on the floor. It clanked against the hard surface. Much to my surprise, no agonizing jolt leapt up my nerves. I examined my amputated limb. A sheath of bronze metal capped my forearm, below the elbow. A black, spongy material adhered it to my skin and broken flesh. I lightly rapped at the covering with my fingertip. Not even a slight hint of the taps vibrated through. They saved my life. I was a goner, but this alien thing brought me back from the brink of doom. I pulled myself upright. The centaur rose. He jammed one of his lengthy fingers into a hole in one of the consoles before it disappeared into the gap. I saw that he wore a silver ring on that finger. An orb at the center of the room glowed red. Five holographic images displayed in the air above it. I recognized all of them but two. An Isocupy, Ant, and Behemoth rotated around a central axis. The fourth image that orbited with them looked like six armed starfish. A tentacle-filled cavity lay in its middle. They moved around a bulging twist of fibrous tendons. The closest resemblance I drew to something on Earth was a mixture between a heart and a conch shell. The centaur twisted his finger and laser lines formed between the four outer images and the heart. He withdrew the digit and grabbed one of his swords from where it leaned on the wall. First, he pointed it at himself, then at me, and finally, he stabbed it through the hologram of the heart. I nodded in understanding. Despite the obvious, inevitable communications barrier, we seemed at the very least able to comprehend each other's motives. The centaur rummaged around and then handed me my armaments. He grabbed the P320. It looked to be in working condition, dirty but functioning. He passed me the saw. With immense effort, I cleared the double-fed rounds that had caused the malfunction, rested its handguard on my elbow, and tried to look down the sights. The shortness of my limb forced me to aim awkwardly to the side and the weight of the gun caused my bicep to tremble. Not only that, but it would be nearly impossible to load the thing with only my right hand. There was no way I could use it effectively anymore. I tossed it to the ground and settled on defending myself with only the pistol. I checked my pockets for spare magazines and tossed any 556. As I rummaged through my pockets, I felt the contour of Casimir's tag. I pulled it out and stared for a moment. I'm gonna kill this thing, Gallo. Even if I have to do it with my damn teeth. I don't think I'll be able to fulfill my promise, though. But at least your family will be safe. I tucked the dog tag away and finished counting ammo. I practiced loading and cocking my P320 until I was sure that I could perform the actions under duress. It was a hell of a learning curve. I discovered that the most efficient method involved dropping the mag, resting the slide in the crook of my left elbow, jamming in another magazine, then chambering around by racking the slide over my skin. Satisfied that I could still fight, I nodded to the centaur, and we set out. The tower that I had used to navigate showed me that my initial heading had been correct. The alien centaur led me through a labyrinth of battered metal. He moved around twists and turns without missing a beat. Has he done this before? Or is this the culmination of some careful scouting? The former thought scared me. If this killing machine had failed before, how can my crippled ass turn the tide? I pushed the doubts aside. It didn't really matter anyway. I would fight regardless. The density of enemies grew as we drew closer to the heart. The centaur and I avoided most of them, but we were forced to eliminate several roaming gangs. Fortunately, the centaur dispatched most with his superior beam gun and mopped up the rest of the Icosopi and ants with twirling blades. I only fired when it became necessary. Regardless, my stock of ammunition dwindled to nearly nil. I was down to three 15-round magazines. Worry tempered my aggression. 
I can't kill them with rocks and dust. We need to get to the heart and soon. We crested over a hill and I saw a low plateau in the distance. The centaur paused for a moment to point one of his blades at the geological formation. That must be where it is. If we can just get through without another fight, we might just pull this off. I waited for the centaur to resume our course, but he just stood there. I looked over the field that lay before us and the mesa. A legion of tentacles waited for us. There was no way that we could defeat them all. We needed a distraction. An insane idea popped into my head. I backtracked until I found a hidden alcove in the rubble with space enough for both me and the centaur. Go wait in there, I said to the centaur and pointed to the hiding spot. He remained planted in place without understanding. I groaned and holstered my pistol. I pushed at his armor. Damn, this guy is heavy as shit, I thought. He got the message and sauntered into the alcove. I nodded in affirmation when he vanished from sight. I ran a distance back and made sure that there was still a clear line of open area to the field. For this gambit to work, I needed as many of the creatures as possible to fall for the deceit. I dug a shallow hole and planted my last grenade. I piled loose ashen dirt around it and pulled the pin. It worked. The dust held the lever in place. Just to bait the trap further, I grabbed a loose shard of metal and cut at the exposed part of my left forearm. Blood dribbled over the surrounding area. Using the same metal, I carved a hole in the top of my canteen. I spaced a pair of stones over the grenade to invert the receptacle upside down. The slow trickle of water eroded the soft dirt. I sprinted back to the hiding place. The grenade exploded just before I arrived back in the hovel. As I expected, hordes of ants and icosapi flooded through the path. I plunged into the hidden spot just before the clear creatures noticed my presence. The centaur almost rushed out to fight. I held up my arm to stop him, and remarkably he waited. I kept my arm up until the racket of movement outside faded. I swung my arm toward the exit, and we both ran out and toward the plateau. Our path was nearly empty. The centaur drove his blades through any that remained, and we almost reached the stone formation before I saw the rivers of fluid. Two half-formed behemoths sat between us and a tunnel leading into the mountain. The liquid pooled at their feet and flowed up to form the massive trunks of their legs. It solidified into their bodies and darkened into the congealed brown missiles on top. They were smaller than the one that Gallo had killed, but still stood a healthy 30 feet above us. I shot a full magazine into the one on our left that seemed closer to completion. The lead bored a small hole in its surface. It seemed relatively unharmed by my inferior weapon. I dropped to the ground as a barrage of missiles shot out of its back. The brown spikes sailed sporadically through the air and covered a wide area. None of the random missiles landed even close to me. One buried itself next to the centaur, but his armor deflected the shrapnel. He aimed his gun and fired a purple beam. It struck the center of the cavity I had formed and drove its way through the behemoth. Its internal organs pressurized and spewed channels of orange blood through its outer flesh. It fell and started melting. The second one stirred like a dazed reptile that had just hatched. The centaur dashed toward it like a madman, his swords perpendicular to the behemoth's legs. The cluster of tentacles at the head of the monstrosity swung lazily at the centaur. He dodged them with the dexterity of an Olympic gymnast. Blades cut through the partially formed legs, and the behemoth staggered. Suddenly, a massive ball of blue plasma struck the behemoth. It died instantly, and the resulting shockwave sent the centaur careening through the air. The brown spikes on its back all burst at once, sending shards in all directions. The centaur's armor proved not enough. The projectiles shredded his pale skin. I looked up at the cliff. For the first time in person, I witnessed the six-armed starfish. 
It clung to the cliff of the mesa and pointed its maw toward me. Another ball of blue materialized and expanded in the nest of the starfish's tendrils. I pumped the trigger without aiming. By some twist of fate, a single shot landed in the center of the plasma. The resulting reaction blasted the thing free from its stone perch. Its limbs splattered heavily on the ground. Stillness enveloped us. The defeated creatures disintegrated noiselessly. I somberly approached the centaur. Most of his legs were dissolving. Brown spikes dotted the skin around his armor. Only his two left arms remained. Open sores covered one. Dark green spurted from his wounds. I fell to my knees beside my twitching ally. My vision grew hazy. I blinked and realized that tears rolled down my cheeks. With his one good hand, the centaur rested his fingers on the top of my pistol and guided its barrel to the slot in his front plate. I had no way to know what went on inside the creature's brain. But were he human, I'm sure that he would have given me a nod of respect and approval. I looked into the slot in his armor and inclined my head. I hoped that he understood the reverence that my gesture meant. I turned my face away and squeezed the trigger. By now, the group that I had baited away were returning. Down to one partial load of ammunition, I snagged the centaur's beam weapon and ran into the tunnel. The gun was lighter than I expected, but its sheer bulk forced me to carry it over my shoulder. The streams of liquid continued through the cave. They illuminated the darkness with a soft glow. It must be close. I've never seen the fluid glow before. The tunnel opened up into a chamber and I saw the immense heart suspended in the center, larger than the hologram had displayed. Tentacles latched it to the ceiling and floor. Luminescent blue orbs coursed through the spiraling tendons of its middle mass. The clear fluid pooled and lapped up its base. I walked to the edge of the pool as quietly as I could and took aim with the beam gun. I wanted to kill it with one shot. The heart pulsed. A ripple spread through the lake and its surface agitated into motion. Millions of tiny icosapi formed in the pool. They sped toward me, like an army of angry wasps from a disturbed nest. I pointed the end of the gun at the bulge of the heart and... Shit, how the fuck do I fire this thing? I balanced the weapon and drew my pistol. The bullets rammed through about five of the creatures at a time, but I ran out of ammo after only seven shots. I chucked the sig at the encroaching wave. It clattered across the floor and smeared a few more icosapi on its way. I kicked and stomped at them when they reached my feet, but there were too many. They scrambled over each other and climbed up my legs. Their minuscule tendrils tore through my uniform and dug into the skin below. The pain multiplied as the little freaks found purchase in my waist and clambered up toward my head. I stopped fighting them and focused on the gun. I ran my fingers over its surface, but there seemed to be no mechanism to trigger it. I turned my head to look and my eye gazed straight into a hole. Zigzags of purple energy ran along the edges of the smooth cylinder. Then I remembered the centaur using the machine. He had stuck a finger into a hole just like this one. The ring must have completed the circuit. I needed something metal. The icosapi chewed away at my torso. They were almost to my chest. I patted my pockets and felt Gallo's dog tag. Pulling it free, I placed it between my teeth. My legs shook and felt faint. I only got one shot at this. My right hand steadied the beam weapon and I aimed again. I felt tentacles brush my neck. I shoved the tack into the hole with my mouth. Blue sparks sprayed out of the hole and singed my cheek. Gallo's tag shot across the chamber. A beam of purple light burst out of the end of the gun and obliterated the heart. The tentacles released their hold. It crashed into the pool. The blue orbs popped like blisters and spread a glow through the liquid. The acosapi melted. They dropped off me in sheets. 
I stood there, wavering, waiting for death, but the pain on my skin subsided to a dull ache. I checked my wounds. They appeared superficial, and none of them wept clear pus. I was beat to a pulp, but I was alive. I searched the chamber and found Gallo's dog tag, still smoldering on the ground. I picked it up. The edge had melted, and most of it was blackened, but I could still see and make out his name stenciled on its surface. Well, looks like you were right about the curse after all, Gallo. I survived, I thought, as I staggered back through the cave toward the portal 